pretty much. It was uh, right. Tell everyone, um, sort of five minutes to go until we start our digital health best practice webinar, which is implementing a sign-on solution. Uh, our experience of Improvata One Sign. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, hopefully, we'll have a good session um, talking about sort of various different things. Um, we have our main speaker today is Dave Martin, who is IT support analyst at Law. Leeds and York, sorry, Partnership Foundation Trust, who's going to be sort of taking us through everything that they sort of experienced uh, with the, the sign-on solution, the single sign-on solution. So, Dave, are you, are you there? Yep, still here. Hello, Dave. Um, and where are you sort of uh, calling in from? I'm calling in from Leeds today. We're, we're actually uh, in our um, IT office. Oh, lovely. Are you sort of, are you, are you kind of enjoying the weather over there? Is it good weather? You know what, we've actually, for the first time in about three months, it's just rained. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I, I kind of forget what rain looks like now, so kind of getting yeah, used to the too. weather. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's still um, very hot and muggy, but it did actually, uh, yeah, it did start raining a bit earlier on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, kind of uh, getting over the England defeat, I'm sure everyone's kind of in a bit of a, I think, I think the weather reflects the results really, doesn't it? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, but, uh, um, I'm over the hangover. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people are. I think I saw yeah. a lot of sore heads yesterday. Mm. Um, so yeah, hopefully everyone is starting to join in. Um, mm -hmm. So we will be talking through um, how kind of Leeds and York Partnership have uh, identified as the, sort of the need for the single line solution. Um, so Dave, sort of just want to give a brief summary at first. Yeah, um, it was. Um uh, obviously, I deal with uh, a lot of the projects. Uh, I've got the autonomy to identify projects if I think they're needed, and some of them are passed down to me from the business analysis team. But this particular one uh, came from myself. Was the thing I was hearing the most from being on site, because I still, still maintain a level of uh, second and third line support, so I'm on site quite a lot, speak to users quite a lot. And one of the things I hear most is just the annoyance of how many different variations of usernames and passwords. I did just a quick analysis of what I thought your average user would log on to, and I counted nine different systems. You know, we've got systems for our patient administration, we've got email, we even book our annual leave and meeting rooms and everything's all done on uh, a separate system these days. And they're, they're just the, some, some usernames are email addresses, some are uh, some variation of your name, and it was just people were just having to write these things down, which is potential IG breach, just not the way to do it. And I thought I'd just start testing the market, really, for a, a product that just combined all this and uh, did that for the user. Oh, good. And hopefully, um, at the end, we'll be able to uh, take some people's questions. Um, you know, so mm -hmm. if people sort of are joining us now, if they kind of want to get their questions uh, written down, you've got two options. There's either a chat option or you can put them in the Q&A um, and I will hopefully put them to Dave. And we also have um, Andy Wilcox on standby, who's the Global Product Marketing Manager from Improvata. So he'll be able to sort of supply sort of some knowledge from the uh, supplier side. So hopefully we should yeah, be in for a good session. Oh, sorry. Hi, Andy. I didn't realise you were sort of uh, there at the moment. <laughs> in the background. Yeah, good afternoon. Yeah, in the background. Hi, Dave. So, yeah, Andy, <laughs> Hi, Where are you about to you calling from, Andy? I'm uh, in the very sunny Cambridge today. Oh, very nice. Very good. Right, so we hopefully should get started in the next sort of few minutes, just waiting for some few more people to join us. Um, thank you to everyone who is joining us. Um, I understand it's probably your lunch time, and everyone's probably running out, wants to run outside to, to grab their lunch. So I appreciate everyone's time to join us. So we should just wait a few more minutes to see if anyone else sort of wants to jump in. Right, so it's now uh, 12.30 on the dot, so we shall get started. Um, thank you again to everyone who is joining us uh, on this rather sunny Friday afternoon for our latest in the series of the Digital Health Best Practice webinar, which uh, this has the rather exciting title of Implementing a Single Sign-On Solution, Our Experience of Improvata One Sign. Um, today we've got uh, our main presenter is Dave Martin, who is the IT Support Analyst uh, from Leeds and York Partnership Foundation Trust. So hello to Dave. And, Hi, everyone. Um, so, 
And so David's going to be sort of taking us through um, how sort of the trust identified the need for the solution and address any issues and sort of how the application sort of access went within the trust and you know, the potential, you know, challenges um, and what, you know, they faced when they implemented the system. Um, so just sort of uh, setting the scene, you know, Improvata provide the single sign-up, which um, saves collisions from obviously having to sign in from multiple systems. Uh, the aim is sort of to increase productivity and security for any of those, you know, working in busy, high-pressure environments. You know, as I'm not a clinician myself, but I know it's sort of highly frustrating when you have to log on onto so many different, you know, access points and all that. So I guess it all makes sense. Um, but then other issues, you know, sometimes people are worried about price and all those things. So we're hoping to sort of discuss all those issues in this session today. Um, towards the end of the session, uh, or during the session, sorry, um, you're able to answer que ask questions um, through the chat bot or the Q&A section. Um, so if you want to put your questions to Dave. And we also have uh, Andy Wilcox, who's the Global Product and Marketing Manager in Provata from the supplier side. So he'll be able to answer any other questions that you may have from that side. So I will take it. I will pass it over to you, Dave. Um, so yeah, take it away. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. As Hannah said, I am an ICT support analyst for Leeds and York Partnership Foundation Trust, and we've been using uh, Improvata OneSign uh, for three years now, um, or at least that was uh, that was when we began uh, with the training and began with the implementation. So I'll give you a very quick background as to who we are and what we do. We provide adult, adult sorry, mental health care for Leeds and York and the surrounding area. Um, we know um, acute um, therapy and um, nothing in paediatrics, particularly there. Um, we, we just surround everything around adult mental health care. We employ around 3,000 people uh, across the lot count around 120 sites. Um, and so obviously the, uh, the support for that across a busy city like Leeds without a particularly brilliant road network is quite, uh, quite a challenge. So uh, the more we can do remotely, the better. Um, we have a large number of community-based staff, and there is, therein lies one of the major reasons why we needed some uh, solution to, um, to capture passwords and just make the whole logon experience for the users a lot easier because some of them are out there using 4G connectivity uh, in other people's buildings and they just need an easier, as easy a ride as we can give them when it comes to uh, their IT experience. We have a mixed economy of laptops and desktops. Traditionally, as you would expect, the admin teams, the people that are sit, sat at a desk for their entire day's work, will work from a desktop. Uh, usually, um, some variety of Dell Optiplex, although we've started moving into a smaller uh, Intel device called the NUC which is um, provides the same kind of thing, but on Windows 10. So we have a mixed economy of Windows 10 and Windows 7. And we also have a, a large number of laptop users out there, most of the community staff or anybody that's uh, out and about a lot for meetings. Uh, and as I said earlier, we've no acute departments, so we've no A&E here, for example. Um, but we do have many ward-based staff. Um, and a lot of people in a in a hospital type environment. Right, the systems we use. I'm not going to go through all of these and tell you what each one of them is. I'm sure you're not remotely <laughs> interested in what each one of these actually does. But this is just to give you an idea of how many systems we have. Paris is our um, patient administration system. Many of you may use EMIS or System One. Or Care Director. There's plenty more out there than than what we use. Outlook and NHS Mail, almost everybody in the trust will use those two systems. Um, iLearn is the system that provides our uh, online learning uh, for all the mandatory training that we do. Health roster, self-explanatory, that sets your um, shifts if you're a shift worker, but we also book annual leave through that, and we use even for the nine to five staff, uh, we'll have a presence on health roster. First care is our uh, sick. Uh, sickness reporting system. Uh, we use an electronic system for procurement, which is the EPROC system there that you can see. Datix is our reporting, incident reporting uh, tool. And we have many more besides. But those, those ones that you're seeing on the screen now, almost everybody in the trust, almost everybody in our organization will have to log on to that particular set of applications. And just looking there, there's, there's that's 
that's a lot of usernames and passwords for your standard user to have to remember. So why did we pick one sign? Well, I went to the market for this. I was just explained to Hannah before we started. Uh, being on site a lot as I am, I hear a lot of people, the thing I heard most, a lot of our users saying just how many usernames and passwords they have to remember, how they often forget them, get locked out of systems, have to spend time sat in a queue on the service desk waiting for passwords to be reset. Passwords, of course, have all got different different criteria, different specifications. Usernames are sometimes emails. There's sometimes a variation of your surname and first name, etc. They were all different. It was causing a lot of headaches. It was causing a lot of calls to the um, service desk. And we we think at one time about 65% of the calls coming to our service desk was some kind of password reset. So um, went to the market, had a look what there was. We found one sign. We found that very early on, had a presentation, were extremely impressed with what we saw. Um, doing our due diligence, of course, we always would. We also found a product called Caradine, which we also had a presentation with. And again, it's a good product, but it's, uh, it didn't tick quite as many boxes as one sign did. And we, there was a Windows own, uh, own built system. There's also a Dell system as well that we found, neither of which covered. Um, all the criteria that we needed. The two that did were one sign in Caradine and one sign looked like market leader. We went on reputation. Our research on that from some other organizations locally that used them said that they were very good. Um, I have a, a, a friend in IT, a very completely independent um, research tool for me, if you like, because he doesn't do any work with us here, uh, who also recommended one sign as being an extremely good product. Uh, it has an existing presence throughout the NHS. Um, there are three organizations in Leeds alone that, um, that work with the NHS as a teaching hospitals and the uh, healthcare team. And two out of the three of us use one sign already. So it gives you an idea of two thirds of one city using that product. Shows it's going to be one of the best ones. Um, and as I said, the personal research I have other avenues to explore when I'm looking for uh, products in uh, in any environment for the NHS. And also the price. Um, I'm, I'm not here to tell you that it's the cheapest product on the market. Um, it, it wasn't, um, but as I'm sure we've all seen in every aspect of life, uh, you get what you pay for. And some of the other solutions that we saw there did come in at a lower price, but simply didn't do as many things as as one sign can do. Right, the implementation stage of this was uh, was uh, was good fun. We we started it in in August three years ago, and we had um, a gentleman called Harry come to see me and help me build the uh, the servers and started the training. It was a similar to day to this. It was about thirty degrees, and we stuck him in a non air conditioned training room and. Uh, Kept him there for three days, uh, showing me how to to profile Improvata and set the uh, set the system up and deploy it. Um, I have to say, it's, it's not difficult. Um, it's not difficult at all. It's um, it's, it's very self-explanatory, and it's um, it's very logical how it lays out. We did have some challenges, however. We have one system that, particularly, which is our patient administration system, that is um, hosted elsewhere, and it's hosted in a Citrix environment. And because of some of the constraints of that system, it's quite an old Citrix environment, and it did involve me having to spend quite a bit of time uh, remoting in onto their systems to set that up. But I would say that was more of a limitation of the system that we were trying to profile, not Improvata. Improvata did work, and it still, to this day, works with that system, but, but it was, it's, it's all the technology. And that was the biggest challenge I faced, partly just getting uh, getting the Paris people to actually allow me to have remote access onto their servers was quite a, a challenge. Uh, we had another challenge around Outlook. We have um, a number of users uh, have more than one Outlook profile. Um, it's fine if you just log in as your own email address, like I do, for example. You just check in your own inbox. 
it works absolutely fine. If you've got, like our IT help desk might, for example, they have their own personal email, but they also have the IT help desk inbox to check as well. Um, it took a while to get that to, uh, to work seamlessly and uh, a bit more smoothly, but uh, we got there in the end. And the one thing about Improvata is that they will not leave you on your own to sort these things out. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth a little uh, in, in a minute or two about the um, support side of it. Um, but, but they really do go beyond the call of duty to help you out if you are facing any challenges. So profiling, again, um, Harry showed me the, uh, the profiling. It was, uh, I think, sort of the best part of, a, of one day of the course. And uh, once learned, never forgotten, really. It's, it's quite a straightforward system to use. Uh, you simply drag an arrow over the uh, username and password window, and it pretty much does the rest for you. There are some uh, instances where it, you have to get involved with a little bit of code writing, but it's very rare, and it's, and it's quite straightforward. Uh, and yeah, as I was just about to come to that, the after sales with Improvata is, is, is better than any company I've ever been involved with, and I've put quite a lot of systems into this organization in the 17 years I've been here. Um, we had a, a, a fortnightly telephone conversation with our after sales uh, manager who was checking where we were at with things. We did have a bit of a lull where we were up. We allowed another project to interfere with this one, and I had to put this on hold for a few weeks, but they were very encouraging of getting me back into uh, the swing of things once we'd got past that. And just any question you, you ask them, you can either put it to the support team or the after-sales team. They're, they're not the sort of company that once you've, once you've handed the check over, just leave you to your own devices. They were, uh, they were brilliantly helpful, and that's why largely why I've agreed to do a couple of these um, webinars because I've never been more impressed with a company that I've, um, that I've been a third-party supplier that I've been involved with and all the time I've, uh, I've done this job. What's next for us? We are now moving into a VMware environment with our um, estate of um, initially the laptop environment or the, what you might call the mobile, the mobile environment, the laptop or tablet environment. But actually now our wards have gone onto a VMware solution where we, uh, we're trying to match the, um, the remote experience with uh, what you see when you're actually sat at your desk. So you don't have to learn two different ways, three, four different ways of getting into systems. We're just trying to line all that up, and we're doing that with, uh, with VMware. Improvata are helping us with that. Um, and we, we're now moving them beyond just the smart card in the slot type of logon. We're now going into tap on, tap off, and proximity readers. We have just, uh, well, we're about two-thirds of the way through the follow me print. Um, a project that we now basically have tap on tap off printing uh, with something called safe queue whereby you can um, you can just send your print job to any print queue and you just arrive you just walk to the nearest printer that you happen to be standing next to wave your smart card over it and uh, out comes your print uh, we are looking into follow me desktop now we haven't started this yet uh, but we have spoken to Improvata about it, and they assure us that um, one sign sits very nicely in that environment and with that system. So uh, watch this space. One day we will be uh, we will be going down that route. That's basically most of what I have to say about our experience of installing uh, and running Improvata over the last three years here at Leeds and York. And if anybody wants to ask me any questions. Um, fire away. Love you. are doing my job for me, Dave. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I will just kick it off, um, if you don't mind, sort of, uh, in terms of, you know, how, what, give us, can you kind of give us a picture of what is happening on the, uh, on the ward as a result? Yeah. You know, we've had uh, a report this week um, from the Royal College of Nursing, which is saying, you know, nurses and, and, and involvement in in technology is really key to, to the uptake of, of implement, implementation and technology actually being used. So I'd, it would just be good to get a picture of um, what impact this is actually having on clinicians. clinicians sorry. Yeah, I mean, this is, um, as projects go, this was always going to be 
a, a more popular one, an easier one, if you like. Um, just to give you a very quick example of another one I'm working on, um, we're installing digital dictation systems across the uh, board between admin and consultants. And obviously, there's some resistance to that because you're changing people's workflow. You're changing, <clears throat> you're telling somebody who sits and types a letter in a Word document and then puts it in an envelope to the um, to the patient. You're now saying, no, you've got to use a system to do this. And there's, a, there's always a bit of a sense of IT being done to people, I think, with other projects. With this, there's nothing but upside. You know, you were just making life easier for people. Nobody had to change anything about the way they work. We were just answering their biggest gripe, which was, why do I have to remember all these usernames and passwords? And the answer was, you don't know. We put a system in. You can um, you type it in once, and that's it. It's, it's done for it's done forever. And uh, we've worked out certainly it's cut the um, it's cut the calls to the service desk, and that frees up the service desk for people to be able to answer the call instantly when a clinician has, has a genuine IT problem that's not just a forgotten password. So it's freeing time up there, but then I, I think the measure was that even if it saved a clinician 30 seconds a day of logging in time, add that up to the amount of clinicians we've got in one organization and then times it by five for the days of the week, and you, you're talking hours already per week. Lovely. We've had some, just some questions through. Um, so mm -hmm. Ken Nolan um, has asked, uh, how did you roll it out to the users? We here we use SCCM um, for the actual practical side of it. That's the as in the, the IT side of it. So we we loaded it into um, an SCC packaged it into an SCCM client and uh, put it out that way. We did it site by site of the major sites. So. Um, We've got six major buildings here with, you know, several hundred staff in them, and we we would send out a communication in the days leading up to it, um, which we took from Active Directory and basically just emailed everybody individually. We put uh, information on our intranet, and then we went one one week uh, per site, if you like. So we would then have a we would distribute the software overnight, but then be on site that morning, myself and a colleague um, would be there to answer any questions. Um, just help a few of the key users set the passwords up, just show them what it was all about, and then we'd move on and do the same thing at one of the other major sites the following week, and then, then we just tackled the smaller the smaller sites. I think we did the, the entire thing in less than three months. Sounds good. And so, just a follow-up to that. I mean, what was the response from doctors, and nurses? You know, when you were starting that rollout, what what response did you get? So it's mostly positive. I mean, there's always always somebody that decides that they're going to try and claim that there's some sort of IG issue or that it's actually not helping because you know they they accidentally typed the wrong password in at the first stage, and you know it was, it was obviously then returning the the wrong password for them. But the the vast, I would say, the vast majority. Um, just thought it was something that, that, that we should have done years before. And that, that was the only real complaint people had, said, so why haven't we always had this? Yeah, it's always quite a, a typical response, I guess, for yeah. clinicians. Um, we've got another question from Sophie Hannaby. Um, so she mm -hmm. says, uh, did, did you use uh, kiosk models and multi-user desktops? And if so, how did you decide where these profiles were used? We tested that. Yes, we did. We, when we were trialing, we used a kiosk-based system for our. Um, we only really have the um, what we call a crisis resolution team. They're the only real 24-hour service we have that has a kind of almost an acute environment about it. They're the people that may require the fast switching. Um, we we trialed that, but in fact, we found that when we uh, when we went back to the normal profile, and they actually preferred going back to the sort of what we call client one, which is the um, uh, the, the, the non-kiosk version. There is a hybrid um, client now, which allows sort of the benefits of fast switching, um, but without the um, sort of cumbersomeness of, uh, of everybody having their own profile. But we we just decided to, in the end to go with the same client for everybody because um, it was, we were having problems 
um, mapping drives for them in that environment. I gather it has uh, the, the hybrid client does get past that as an issue, but I, it's hard for me to comment on that really because we we haven't we haven't actually trialed that hybrid client. Sorry Thanks, if that doesn't fully answer that question. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Um, we'll move on to the next one. Um, so Nilesh um, says, we are looking at facial recognition for our digital whiteboards and asked, would this solution work in this use case? Uh, I guess yeah. that's a question for me. Yeah, because I hardly time that one for that one. Yes. Um, no, I mean, the one-sign solution is primarily, in terms of authentication management, is smart cards or... Um, HID cards or fingerprint. Uh, we don't. There isn't an integrated uh, a solution that uses facial recognition for for this at the minute. Yeah, thank you very much, Andy. I'll move on to the next one. Um, so, Cathal from HSE Island um, asks: Does the single sign-on solution integrate with uh, electronic health records? Which again, I think is probably a question for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, in general, I mean, Dave can talk maybe specifically about any, the EHR side that he has within his trust. I mean, in general, our solution integrates with all of the all EHRs that we see in the market. So, from the likes of Cerna and Epic and InterSystems and Meditech, and some of the smaller ones or, or more localized ones like um i mean from cerner also make one called ish med and medico we integrate with the, the emis symphony solution i mean in total i mean, I mean there's around about sixteen thousand different uh, software applications that we can or have done integrations with so broadly the simple answer is yes andy would so would, would you be also able to perhaps embellish a little on the question that sophie asked that obviously i've only got experience of what we trialed here and we only trialed the um kiosk yeah. client quite briefly i don't you probably could give me a, i'll probably give sophie a little more uh information on on that than i could yeah well I mean, certainly from a the, the single sign on an authentication management pers um, solution perspective i mean i mean it, we work very happily with multi-user desktops i mean the, the thing we always find when we see people use uh, mud solutions is that you know, they can become resource constrained if you have lots of different users logging in and tapping in and maybe not tapping out of the system and you end up with it, you're constrained by memory and, and such like. But certainly we have quite a few of our customers that do operate in both kiosk mode, multi-use desktops. Um, and also I know you referred to follow me desktop, Dave, as well, that you're looking yeah. at. I mean, that's a very yeah. popular way to use it with, with a VM environment where you can tap off one machine and, and tap onto another and be back exactly where you were. So it, it, the, fle the solution provides great flexibility depending on how you as an organization want to work. And in, you know, in Dave's case, they, they picked the right solution for their environment. Lovely. Thank you very much, both. Um, I will move on to the next one, if that's all right. So we've got a question from mm -hmm. Phil. Um, he's saying, uh, did you target a pilot area first? And if so, how many users did it involve? Yes, we did. We we targeted the, the building that contains the IT department because it does also contain clinical staff um, and has, you know, we, we have um, almost like a semi-ward kind of environment. We have service users come to, to us in that building. And of course, the idea being that we were just upstairs in IT if we could, you know, if we if we uh, if we were required, there are approximately 220 users on that site. From memory, this is, this is three years ago now. And it's it's based in three buildings. Is this particular site? And again, I think we did even like a micro rollout of doing a building at the time there. So we didn't throw it at all 220 users instantly. It may have gone to something like 80 or 90 initially, and then moved on to the next building. The following week, and then I think once we'd established that was fine, we did the third building literally a day or two later. But that's that's from memory of around three years ago. Uh, we wanted a full week of just a relatively small user base, first of all, to um, to iron out any issues that we might have, and and not you know, not let the project get a, a a bad reputation because we'd gone too wide too early. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. Um, and Keith had another separate question, um, saying, um, "How have you got round printing in kiosk mode?" Well, we don't use kiosk mode, unfortunately. Um, 
don't know how could really answer that at this stage. I think we've um, when we did the um, the trial um, of our ICS site, we we were very it was very different how we handled printing then. I think I, I, from memory, I just installed the printer as a local IP address um, onto that machine, so anybody that logged onto that machine would just see the local printer. So even though it was a networked printer, they would just see their um, the network printer that, that was closest to them. It wasn't really an ideal solution, although it did work. Um, it's probably I think technology has moved on a little in that three years there, so I'm not sure that the way we handled that would necessarily be relevant now. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, we've got a question from Robert, and he's saying, um, did you have any issues with users accidentally cross-linking application accounts, uh, for example, saying a nurse logging into a PC and then accidentally learning a, a doctor's application password against her profile? Um, should I admit to this <laughs> on a call? We did. Um, I mean, the, the unfortunate thing is that that's an IG breach on the user's part. That's not the technology failing, in my view. Um, we did have an incident where it wasn't it, it wasn't between a doctor and a nurse, but it was between two colleagues, two admin colleagues. One logged on to the uh, to their desktop, left it open. Somebody else logged into Paris. Um, it must have been the first time they'd used that logon and the single sign-on because it's only possible. Uh, in the first instance, but they signed into Paris with their own credentials, and of course that that did sort of cross pollinate those two users, um, which a Datix then followed in a bit of an investigation from our information governance team. But the uh, the outcome of that was that the um, you know the users just have to be more mindful of checking that, that, that you know that it's not that it is them that's logged on when they jump on there, and the other user is one that you've got to remember to lock your screen when you leave it um, unattended. Yeah, because I guess it goes back to one of the questions that I had, um, kind of with the challenges. Did you find kind of changing staff's behaviour was a challenge? Um, a little. A li in theory, they should have already been, you know, if they were working to the guidelines of the information toolkit, information governance toolkit, it, it should never be an issue. But as, as we all know, in reality, what you know, even trained people, what they should do and what they sometimes do actually do can be different things. Um, you know, the, the human element can always break any system, can't it? And that's uh, that did happen in, in this instance. I mean, it, it is, you know, the probability of it happening is quite slim because even if you did leave your uh, machine unlocked, if you'd already logged on to your systems, they would literally just get your log on. They would, even if they went to the major... You made your patient system, in our case Paris or System 1 or, or whatever it is you use. If you've already set yourself up for that, they would be in under your login just the same as they would be without without one sign. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, could, I, could I, I was yeah, just going to chime yeah. in on the, on the learning, on the learning the incorrect user password. I mean, as Dave illustrates, I think from a technology perspective, the, the system will only learn what you enter so as a user if you're logged in and leave the work the only way we have to do it is if you as a user logged in and then walked away and let someone else log into the application on the first attempt to do it and that's uh, you know, the system there's no way for it to cross pollinate outside of those constraints and actually once you've got the the, the tap in tap out it becomes a lot easier for uh, users to log out of a system when they walk away from it and that it can actually encourage better behavior by by making it simpler to log out and therefore make it less of a of, of a potential problem for that kind of thing to happen lovely thank you so much andy um, and robert just had a quickly he had a follow-up question saying uh, did you have any application stability issues uh, for example the one sign client causing an application or sort of say windows to perform incorrectly uh, no, not at all. I mean, it's, it's a very unintrusive um, client anyway. It, it, it just sits in the uh, in the background and uh, it doesn't use up a lot of the device's resources. So it's not you know it's not pulling on the CPU or the RAM particularly. Um, it doesn't. 
it hasn't caused any systems to become unstable, not at all. No, we've uh, the only problems we've had with certain systems sometimes is profiling them correctly, but uh, it doesn't cause any uh, any particular issues there. What, one thing I would say, if, if you you know if you really wanted to find a problem, sometimes where users have multiple logins to a system, it can get a little confused. Um, and we've, you know, we've we've had to develop ways around that. So you may, for example, um, in our rostering system, you may go in to check your own roster, but you may also be somebody's line manager. So you may go in. You know, our system's slightly different in that you would log in with different credentials if you were setting the roster yourself to if you were just checking your own um, shift pattern. And um, the, that dual logon has caused one or two issues in the past. Um, but again, you, you just if you get Improvata support involved, we're very good at, um, at helping you get to the bottom of this. But I wouldn't say that I, I definitely couldn't say that Improvata itself has ever caused uh, another application to become unstable. And Andy, sort of taking, taking that question to you, have you kind of experienced have Improvata kind of come across any of these you know, such issues? <laughs> probably not the most impartial person to to ask. Putting <laughs> 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 my hands up. I mean, certainly. Yeah, yeah. It's a piece of software, so I'm, I'm, I've never made a claim that it's completely and utterly infallible. And, and we, you know, there are many of our customers out there that use it without any problems whatsoever. We do, you know, we have a support desk for a reason. Sometimes there are issues, uh, you know, but inherently, as, as Dave said quite openly, it's very stable. It, it it operates very quietly in the background. It doesn't consume massive amount of resources. And it, it plays very well with a, a massive amount of applications, and and you know consequently we don't see a lot of problems with it. It is a very stable piece of software. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to jump in and ask a question myself because just while I've got you both on, obviously in the webinar, how has the relationship between obviously you know Improvata and the trust? I mean, how important has that support from Improvata been to you, Dave? Sort of in the sort of process before, uh, during the, you know, the rollout of it and, you know, afterwards? Uh, yeah, I would say vital. Um, I, I mean, in some ways, I, I've um, I discussed this with somebody about another product, but um, you, you'd almost rather have, if you go into the market, you'd almost rather have the third best product with the best support than the best product with no support whatsoever. Um, Improvative, fortunately, you know, is, is up there at the top on both of those measures anyway. But the, the, the the thing is that you don't know what you're going to come up against when you're launching a new system, particularly. You've got a good idea of what 75% of the project's going to look like, but you, you really don't know um, everything about it before you start. And, the you know, products are complicated. You, you, in my position, I can't be an expert on every uh, application we put onto the infrastructure. And I need that third-party backing. I need somebody at the end of the phone or on the other end of an email that will say, yeah, yeah, it's okay. We know how to sort that. Just, just, um, just open a remote session, for example, and we'll, we'll have a look at it. Um, I mean, it, uh, I would say Improvata have um, allowed me to bend the rules a little. I think on support at times that they've, uh, they've, they've dealt with things on the service desk as, um, you know, as a non-chargeable call. When really, I think I would have been happy to have. Uh, uh, you know, if, you, if you're profiling something, for example, from scratch, it's not perceived as just a natural support call. But if something breaks, it's obviously a support call. Well, they've, they've, I'm sure they've um, they've allowed me some discretion in that, and they've, they've been really, you know, they've, they've really been helpful. I've spent, I remember spending a, a call with um, one of the support guys. I was on there for over an hour with him. He just just would not let this go until he'd fixed it. And he was he got there in the end with it. I think it was, was it Greg. Andy is there. Greg on the help desk. Yeah, Greg's one of our. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, one of our support guys. He's yeah, he's guys very here. tenacious. <laughs> he gets there. In, you know, he always gets there. Uh, he always makes sure he's got it where we're entirely happy with before he uh, before he lets that call go. So yeah, they, they've been um, they, they've been vital really. It's you know they, it, it always is with. Um, uh, with, a, with a new product to you. You've got to have that backup. You really do. Thank you very much, Dave. And um, we've got another question from Sophie, who's asked, uh, what is your process for locum or agency staff having access to OneSign? 
Well, our uh, any temporary staff um, of any description, first of all, have to go uh, on a training session to be information governance trained before they're allowed anywhere near any of our systems. So we begin with a student login, which is monitored by the um, tutor. Um, they do their information governance training and any other relevant IT training at that point. Although the other the other training packages beyond IG are not a legal requirement, but until you've done your information governance training, you won't get access to our systems. Once you've done that, our service desk then will set you up with your own username and login, uh, and you would just work whether you're a temp that's come in just for a day and a half, or whether you're a permanent member of staff that's been here 20 years, you will get a username and password um, just the same. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to take a question as well. Um, so in terms of, you mentioned, you know, uh, one size helped increase productivity. Have you kind of seen any yeah. results of that yet? And can you kind of give me an example? We had, um, unfortunately, the, the service desk itself, the reporting tools that we've got on call monitoring came in after we did one I came in after we did the one sign project. So other than approximate um example you know, other than sort of approximate reporting, I couldn't tell you that it brought, for example, uh the that sixty five percent figure that I gave you for password resets, I couldn't say it brought it down to, for example, thirty five percent with absolute certainty. Uh but having spoken with the service desk manager uh, it's a, it has vastly reduced the amount of um, password resets that we do. So consequently, we don't have that spike on a Monday morning, for example, and we can now just get to the crux of um, speaking to the to the users about the issues that they have. So I couldn't say I couldn't tell you how much clinician time that frees up in terms of hours. Unfortunately, I'd like to be able to do that, but I don't have any reporting software to do that. We just know they're spending a lot less time on the phone to IT, they're spending a lot less time locked out of systems. And is that kind of the feedback that you've got from clinicians? Yeah. Um, they have got more time? Yeah, uh, one particular clinician, uh, one of the uh, consultants was saying that the worry was always getting locked out of the system over a weekend because the service desk's not in operation. We have an out of hours service, but it's not really there for resetting passwords. You know, they may do it if you plead your case nicely to them, but she says the, the worry of being locked out over the weekend is not it's not really there one because there's the self there's the self service uh, password reset function via work login uh, and also the fact that you're not you know you're not likely to forget your uh, Paris password because you don't you don't need to input it. Thank you. And we've got another question from Robert who says, did you have any issues with one sign at Windows 10 or Office 2016 slash Flash, sorry, 365. We don't use Office 365, uh, so fortunately I can't uh, I can't answer that one. Uh, we do use Windows 10, and we're not having any uh, any issues at all. Nothing. It just um, just transferred over from seven uh, to ten without any uh, any issues. Um, what was the other one? Office uh, Office 2016. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, other than the Outlook problem that we've had, uh, that we had initially um, with Outlook um, in the first instance, no, we haven't had any, um, hasn't made any difference. The, the, the problem is, obviously, one sign sees the login box and um, and builds its profile in around that. So, obviously, when you move from Windows, sorry, from Office 2010 to Office 2016, you get a different box. So you've got to reprofile that product. So again, we had to go through the same procedure that we'd gone through with uh, Office 2010. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a it's a minor inconvenience for a short period of time, but no, no, it it hasn't caused any problems. Good to hear. Um, I'm going to jump in yeah. with another question as well. Um, uh -huh. In terms of sort of training of staff, because obviously there's been so many reports uh, out at the mm -hmm. moment. Um, a lot of talk. I mean, Eric, Dr. Eric Topol is in the middle of doing a report into ensuring that NHS staff are digitally digitally ready and digitally trained. Um, yeah. Was there kind of any training involved for staff? Not really for the user as such. No, obviously for for, for myself and my team there was 
a lot of training for the profiling side of things. But really, you know, you just you just log on, you put your username and password into each system, and that's that's largely it for the users. It helps for the service desk to be aware of the manage password function, and once. Um, you know, once they've spoken to the user about that, the user might be confident enough. It, that's basically all that is is where you right-click the uh, improvator icon in the system tray, and you can actually uh, remove passwords or change them if you've if you've updated a password on there. Um, that might be a consideration. That might be something that's well worth showing all users. But we decided to tackle that by showing the service desk how to do that, and then any early calls. That we got on that, they could just go through. Um, could just go through that with the user on a need-to-know basis. Yeah, and the kind of sort of like so. Would you say that there was sort of fairly minimal training involved then? Sort of not really much. Yeah. The staff kind of knew what they were doing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how well I explained that. If, if you've not seen the product, that might not have made much sense. But um, in terms of the end user, there's nothing. You wouldn't have to. You know, you wouldn't like obviously for all the other applications that we use, like your system. System ones and things like that. There's quite, um, you know, a lot of training goes into those systems. Improvata doesn't really need anything like that. You just put your password and you're on your way. And just sort of bringing you in, Andy, has, has that kind of been? Has Improvata deliberately done it to make it sort of as, as easy as as easy as possible for for you? Well, I, I mean, if you really kind of dig into what the product's there for, it it's there to, for, to, to make almost access to all of the applications and solutions doctors and nurses are actually using in their day-to-day -day life as transparent as possible. So yeah, it, it's designed to be have minimal user input to, to sit in the background and act as a, a kind of you know, a fabric or, or glue that links all those applications together and just makes it so as a doctor you want to focus on the patient. You don't want to be deciding or trying to remember which password you've got to type in and and that's the whole fundamental ethos of what the product is is, is to make things simple and transparent thank you very much and we've got another question uh, from phil who says did you have to go uh, go through i've taken any further i information governance training for users to really understand their responsibilities not in this case, no. As, um, as I said, it's not. That, that was one of the questions I did. Get. If, if anybody, if any, you know, of the users um, did want to question anything, it was on the information governance side of it, and they did query that. They did say, "Is this safe? Because if somebody sees my initial password, uh, then they'll, they'll they'll have access to everything." But you know, that I, I, I ran this extensively through the uh, information governance team before we even looked at a single sign-on solution, improvata or otherwise. And, um, you know, as long as there's two-factor authentication, which there is, um, there really isn't anything needs to change in terms of information governance. You don't need to add any anything into the training package for the user. You don't need to make, really be aware of anything uh, other than beyond what you already do. I'm just on top of that, because when did you sort of roll, start rolling the uh, one sign-on? Because was it sort of around the time of GDPR? Because obviously that's got add, sort of added sort of what concerns from staff, because yeah, it's a big thing at the moment. Yeah, no, it was a lot lot earlier than that. Um, it was um, towards, I think, as I said, it was around this time of year in 2015 we started to build the servers and have the training. I think we had the product rolled out by Christmas. Uh, maybe just after. So it was, um, it was it was a good couple of years before GDPR. But it's uh, it, you know the principles of of that are still the same um, in terms of the the desktop environment. Yeah. So did you kind of have to change anything, or was it all sort of relatively the same when sort of the new laws came in? No, we didn't have to change anything. And, and I think if anything, if anything in the laws or, or anything that that surrounded. The specifics of the login did change. Improvata tends to have a new release for that kind of um, for that kind of thing. I don't think there's been anything that's really had to the where the product itself has had to change in that time. Um, but when I've spoken to the the, the um, Improvata were acutely aware of the um, IG toolkit um, as it was before GDPR came in, and the, the product lined up 
perfectly with that. So if GDPR had changed anything in that respect, the you know, Improvata would have needed to have changed the product. Uh, Andy might be able to yeah, go I, a bit further on that one for me, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, if you, in terms of, I mean, GDPR itself doesn't make any mandate man, mandates around particular types of security or particular types of products should be in place. It's about uh, you as an organisation understanding what you do with that some somebody's data and ensuring that that you are doing that within the, the, the right sort of um, constraints if you want to put it like that and some of that is about ensuring that only the right people that have access to the date particular types of data can have access and ensuring that you know who has access to data and and both of those are things that one side has all, always supported so one thing that we've seen um, often in not necessarily the NHS but in other healthcare economies throughout Europe is things like the use of group accounts where a group of staff will use one user account to access the EMR or the or the system in general and therefore you've got no way of auditing and tracking who's got access so by using one sign and forcing individuals to have a, to access data using an individual user account you can then know who has accessed it you can control who can access what data and, and for what reasons and therefore be a lot more compliant with gdpr lovely thank you very much and we've had another question come through from robert um did any staff use one sign via remote access or working from home and if they have have there been any issues uh, yes many of our staff uh, work that way uh, one sign in the way we use it uh, we tend not to use the um, most of, many of our users don't go down the uh, VPN route. We have remote um, remote applications published in a website. Um, if you if you're a laptop user and you come into the trust and work from here, one sign will capture your passwords um, as as is true at that point in time. When you then take your laptop home and log in at home, you'll see that the one sign icon actually grays out and goes into an offline mode, but it's still working uh, because it's still captured your passwords as as they were when you were last logged on. You may get a problem if you didn't bring that laptop back to the trust for, say, three months and you changed a couple of your passwords in that time. One sign will probably still be aware of the old passwords and would try to log you in with them. Um, so, but, but we encourage our users to bring any mobile device back to the trust at least once a month because we need them to pick up um, antivirus updates and uh, Windows updates anyway. So we don't we don't really encourage um, people to just use a mobile device solely for mobile purposes. So you're saying that there haven't sort of no issues, uh, you know, at the moment. No, I mean, I, I couldn't comment for everybody. Possibly we've had the odd call to the service desk where somebody has done exactly what I uh, described there, where they may not have brought the... I mean, your worst-case scenario is you um, you bring your laptop in on Monday, um, you then take it home, but then when you come in on Tuesday without it, you change your password, and then your laptop I'm still expecting those passwords to be valid. Uh, we may have had the odd call where somebody has done something similar to that, not brought the laptop in for a while, and one sign has inadvertently thrown the wrong password at the server, at the system. Wouldn't lock them out because it only does it once, uh, but if the user can't remember that password, then they may gain access to that system. Very much. Um, I'm going to jump in as one last question, because uh, one yeah. thing that I've kind of looked at in, you know, when you're looking into to one sign products is, you know, pricing, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it can be seen as quite an expensive um, thing to sort of sign up to. Would, would you say, you know, it, it's worth the money, uh, as a lot of people say? Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah, it isn't, it isn't the cheaper one, obviously, as I, as I explained. Um, and we did look at Caradigm. Um, I think Caradigm came in at a very low price because they didn't have the NHS presence and they were trying to get a bit of a foothold into the market. So I don't know what their pricing is like at the moment. But they did come in quite significantly cheaper, and I did have to make quite a case um, to have one sign because I really did believe it was the better of the two 
of the two products. But it, it, you know, I don't think anybody's pushed since that um, that what we paid for the contract for one sign hasn't been worth it. Certainly, if they did, they've never mentioned it to me, and I would have been the first first person they would have gone to if if they really thought we'd uh, either picked the wrong product or paid too much for it. So. Uh, I, I, and you know, from from the ease of um, of how it just sits there and does its job, and uh, you know, just makes people lives easier. I don't think I think anyone's ever questioned what we paid for it. To be honest. And you sort of mentioned there briefly about having support and how important mm -hmm. things that I was talking to. You, you know, people say having the support of the board and having the support of the trust. How important was it to you uh, with in terms of this project? Yeah, uh, it, obviously important because it was it was one that I picked out myself. It wasn't the the um, it didn't come from a business analyst, for example, didn't this project? It was something that came literally from me. So I suppose to a certain extent, my reputation was on the line a little. Um, but it was it, you know it was it was something that as, as soon as I spoke to our um, chief clinical information officer, he was on board straight away because uh, he said that. That's something that we've been crying out for for quite a while, um, and so to have him on my side, you know, on our side, from day one, actually uh, was a, was a massive help. Uh, other organisations might might find more of a challenge there, but our um, our CTIO is quite quite technology minded anyway. Thank you very much. And um, we've got another question from Robert, who's asking, did you profile your own applications, and if so, roughly how long? it take um our own applications in terms of anything that we have um created you know uh, is, 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 as in a product that we have in house is that yes is I'm guessing so, yeah um we don't really have a specific example of that but we do share a system with the leeds teaching hospitals and they um they created a system that we have full access to and it sits um it sits in a, a data store between the two organizations and it was very very easy it didn't take very long at all the the, the biggest problem with if anything that's web based as long as it's not built on a flash uh you know on a flash, on a flash basis is is extremely easy to to profile the biggest problem i often have is because of the nature of the data that's in some of these systems particularly this system it's a blood results system and it's obviously very very uh, sensitive information. I personally don't have a uh, log on for that system. And the biggest drawback is that you need to, in order to profile the screen, you need to have a successful log on. So you have to often borrow a member of staff for a minute or two and just say, can I just set this, you know, I'm just doing some profiling. Can you please just log on to this screen so I can capture the successful log on screen? Um, which is, you know, that's the biggest challenge is just arranging for somebody to be available to to do that, or to give you a temporary log on with access to nothing, if you like, but just will that will just get you past that initial screen. Thank you very much. Um, I've just got another question about security. Mm -hmm. So, what's one of the sort of probably benefits um, in terms of sort of your side? Um, what impact did uh, sort of one sign on have on security? Um, again, it's, it's like going back to that sort of IG question, really. I think it doesn't, it, it, in a funny way, it doesn't really change anything as far as security is concerned. It doesn't really, um, you know, if everyone's behaving themselves, there's no reason to for it to change anything. I mean, if, you, if the uh, authentication you're using is a smart card and your PIN, if you leave your smart card logged in and your, your PIN number somewhere... Uh, visible, then obviously that's going to compromise security. But that's absolutely no different to leaving your password written down somewhere. And the way our usernames work, which is part of your surname and first name, you know, you could you could guess each other's username, same as you could find somebody's smart card. So it's in a, in, in a funny way, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it certainly doesn't weaken security, um, but I don't think it really changes security in any way. I just, I, I'm just thinking maybe something to chime in on that, Dave. I mean, yeah, uh, um, some of uh, maybe not 
necessarily for yourself, but there's a couple of customers that I've talked to where they've actually said that by using the solution, it allows them to be a lot more strict about complex passwords, which they felt consequently increased security because rather than relying on people or forcing people to change passwords and people falling back to, you know, the pet name with one on the end and then two on the end and then three on the end kind of approach that, you know, we, we, ha we do see that kind of behavior somewhere, especially where you're forcing 30, 60, 90 day password changes that actually by taking the password, the remembering of the password out of the user's hands, it can allow you to be a bit more strict around your password criteria. I know there's a hospital in Australia that were actually creating the passwords themselves, 16 character passwords, which were totally randomized across alphanumeric characters, et cetera, which they felt gave them a very, very strong level of password security because the users weren't being asked to remember them. Lovely. Thank you very much for your input, Andy. I think we've got time for one more question, I think, before we wrap up. Um, Robert again has asked, um, did deploying or upgrading the one sign, um, I guess, from the trust uh, to PCs go smoothly? Actually, that's that's a really good question. It's something I was I was going to mention in the presentation. One of one of the beauties of uh, in Provata one sign is that it's actually very easy to uh, to upgrade. I, I mean, I, I don't think he well, it specifically asked about the server, but that it's worth me mentioning at this point that the um, the servers will upgrade with no downtime, well, with zero downtime, as long as you've got more than one server. So I, I've actually done this during the day in the past, uh, where one server remains um, fully functional while the other one upgrades and restarts, and then it, it automates the process, so it just flicks over to the second server and then so then server one's doing the full functionality while server two restarts. In terms of the um of the desktop deployment, again we, we use SCCM. There's there's more than one way of um of deploying software obviously, but with the SCCM upgrade it's we, we just put it to go out overnight and anything that wasn't left switched on picks it up the next morning and we haven't had an issue uh, at all with an upgrade. The only issue we had when we first deployed um, was, I think there was one product, I think it was Outlook, wouldn't pick up SSL until the user restarted if um, if they just switched the machine on that morning. That was the only issue I can remember coming up and restart very quickly, resolved that. Thank you very much, Dave. So I'm just going to hand it back to you again, just, just do a bit of a summary, um, just kind of any sort of... Um, you know, sum up what at the end, sort of any any other points you'd like to make before we sort of draw it to a close. Yeah, no, I mean, I made most of those points in the um, yeah, in the presentation. Um, I mean, one thing I, I will say is that after 17 years at this organisation, I uh, over the summer I've been offered another position elsewhere as pro IT project manager for another organisation, and one of my plans is to. Um, uh, you know, to to bring in Provata to that organisation as well, and obviously when you're going new to an organisation, you you kind of staking your early reputation on a an early project. But I would be happy for in Provata to um, to be one of the first things I did there because I think that would uh, I think that'd be another successful project, and I think that that would you know would would get gain a very you know, gain you a very early reputation of. Uh, you know, delivering successful projects. And then, Andy, I guess I can hand it over to you. I mean, do you sort of have any sort of closing remarks so you can do a last-minute sort of sales pitch for Improvata? <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to do a sales pitch. Um, I just, I'm first, thank you very much to Dave. I, I mean, uh, we we gave you the floor to talk about this with with, you know, entirely on, off your own back with no guidance. You know, for you to talk about what you thought was the right thing to talk about. So. You know, it, it's a real pleasure that, that we have you as a customer that, and, and you've had such a positive experience. And, you know, us as an organisation, customers are key and customers are, are our most valuable thing. And, and, you know, we invest a lot of time in not just the product, but everything we do as a business to ensure that people get value from the product. Because it's not just about buying a piece of software, it's about what value does it bring to you as an organisation. What value does it bring to you to the clinicians that work within your organisation? And I think that's, yeah, from our perspective, it's not about the price of the product or 
uh, or anything like that. It's about the, the value and benefits it brings to those users on the end. And, and it's really great to hear from Dave firsthand how much of a benefit it is bringing to him. Um, yeah, I think that draws it to the close. Thank you, everyone, um, for sort of tuning in and listening. Uh, you can all run off and uh, sort of grab your lunches now. Uh, and thank you very much to Dave, and very much to, thank you very much to Andy for, for both contributing. Oh, my pleasure. Thank yeah. you. Um, thank you, everyone. Been, thank you. Uh, my name's been Hannah, uh, Hannah Crouch. I'm News Editor at Digital Health. And thank you very much for joining again, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. You too. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.